The name of the disorder is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. At least, that's what we began to call it after 2011. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension. If there were a known cause, it wouldn't be idiopathic, right? Well, maybe not. We know IIH is related to obesity, and we know that IIH is more common in women, particularly women of reproductive age, but yes, technically the cause is obscure, the condition spontaneous. And yet, nearly all patients with IIH have significant synovenous stenosis. The question is, is the synovenous stenosis a cause or a consequence of IIH? Welcome back to Brainwaves, the podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. This week on our program, the role of cerebral sinuses in IIH. Do they collapse because of elevated intracranial pressure or are they congenitally stenotic, resulting in intracranial hypertension due to impaired venous return? We'll address both sides of the argument when our program continues. It's a classic chicken or the egg dilemma. Let's say the chicken is the intracranial pressure that causes stenosis of the cerebral veins and sinuses, and the egg is the synovenous stenosis. It stands to reason that cerebral veins, which lack smooth muscle and are therefore compressible structures, can collapse with increasing pressure within the skull. So what is the theoretical mechanism whereby intracranial pressure rises and compresses the dural sinuses? Early data have largely put to rest the notion that CSF is produced in excess. The same 450 to 500 cc's of CSF is produced every day in healthy controls, and it's produced in the same way in patients with IIH. What seems more likely is that there's impaired resorption of CSF in patients who have idiopathic intracranial hypertension. In several elegant studies dating back to the early 1970s involving patients with IIH, investigators used intrathecal saline infusions and isotope cisternography and they found a substantial delay in CSF resorption among patients who had IIH. After injection of a technetium solution into the subarachnoid space, there was impaired clearance of the isotope. Although, I'll be honest, it's been 50 years and we still don't understand why this happens. But theories exist that arachnoid granulation activity is generally impaired in this condition. Poor CSF resorption in these early studies had nothing to do with the intracranial sinuses. There was simply a problem with CSF egress, leading directly to increased intracranial pressure. The fact that impaired CSF resorption contributes to IIH is supported by case series showing clinical improvement among patients who undergo CSF shunting. And this is old news, like 1955 old. CSF diversion surgeries, either using ventricular peritoneal shunts, or now more commonly, lumboperitoneal shunts, have been shown to chronically relieve intracranial pressure from a myriad of causes. But these procedures have well-described complications, shunt infection, shunt obstruction, need for shunt revision, and as many as half of patients actually require shunt revision. And among those who ultimately get their shunt revised, it's often two or three additional procedures. But diversion can improve visual acuity, and it can prevent the progressive loss of visual function. So it's not all bad. While there have been no randomized clinical trials for CSF diversion, according to a 2015 meta-analysis, which you can find reference in our show notes, which included 17 studies of 435 patients with IIH who underwent CSF diversion, diversion was associated with a rapid improvement in headache for 80% of patients and a visual acuity improvement in 54% over a mean follow-up of about three and a half years. That said, some of the best long-term data came out in 2011. It turns out, in this single 53-patient cohort, nearly 80% of patients continued to experience headaches two years after surgery. Vision improvement seemed durable, but the evidence that lumboperitoneal shunting achieves long-term symptomatic relief is not perfectly consistent. That's basically my whole argument for impairment of CSF resorption as a driving mechanism in IIH. Later, I'll be arguing that stenosis of the transverse sinus is common in IIH, and maybe it's contributory But let's consider the pathophysiology of this. If a transverse sinus is congenitally stenotic, or even occluded, normally the brain will divert venous blood via the contralateral vessel. Problem solved. Now, stenoocclusive venous disease may leave a patient with some residual increase in intracranial pressure. Can't argue against that. 
So maybe it's the degree of sinus stenosis that contributes to the development of intracranial hypertension. Well, if that were the case, why do we see so many asymptomatic hypoplastic sigmoid sinuses, or small sigmoid notches? And why, according to at least one study of 51 patients with IAH and transverse sinus stenosis, was there no correlation between the degree of stenosis and poor clinical course, vision impairment, or CSF opening pressure? You'd presume that, if at least the transverse sinus stenosis were the major mediator of this process, then it should be driving this effect, right? Wrong. Furthermore, why is it that we've seen in several interventional studies that removal of CSF via lumbar puncture can lead to a transient correction of that sinus stenosis for many patients? Doesn't that argue in favor of the sinus stenosis being a consequence and not the cause of IIH? Moving on to the egg of this chicken or the egg debate, could it be that a stenotic intracranial sinus results in elevated intracranial pressure? We already know that cortical vein and dural sinus thrombosis can cause intracranial hypertension, which is one of the primary mechanisms that underlie headaches and nausea and vomiting with sinus thrombosis, and we know that in these patients, the ventricles will remain a normal size despite elevated opening pressure, as they do in IAH. But the question is, can congenitally stenotic sinuses impede the outflow of cerebral blood? Let's start with the argument that sinovenous stenosis correlates with IIH. According to observational data, as many as 60 to closer to 100% of patients who have IIH harbor a stenosis in a major dural sinus, and usually this is the transverse sinus. In fact, according to one early MRV study by Farb and colleagues, published in 2003, the presence of a significant sinus stenosis and otherwise normal brain parenchyma was more than 90% sensitive and specific for IIH. But correlation does not indicate causation, so we need something more convincing than a set of fingerprints at a crime scene. And what is more convincing evidence than clinical trial data? Let's fast forward to June 2017. Mark Dinkin and colleagues at New York Presbyterian published the results of their prospective interventional single-arm trial of transverse sinus stenting. In brief, the investigators recruited 13 patients with IAH who had severe disease and failed medical management, meaning they had failed acetazolamide up to 100 mg BID or to pyramate 100 mg BID for more than two weeks, and to be included, patients had to have no known precipitating cause of IAH, meaning no antecedent use of tetracycline or retinoic acid, no vascular malformation, no antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or kidney disease. The patients also had to have a measurable visual field impairment due to papilledema, they had to have elevated opening pressure on LP, and they had to have a trans stenotic gradient of 8 millimeters of mercury or more between the transverse and sigmoid sinuses during catheter angiogram. Patients also had to have more than 50% stenosis of both transverse sinuses, or they had to have a unilateral stenosis of the dominant sinus in order to be included. All patients underwent transverse sinus stenting, and they were followed for a mean of almost 18 months. Regarding the baseline patient characteristics, and this is important, all patients had headache, 85% endorsed pulsatile tinnitus, three quarters endorsed transient visual obscurations, and half had diplopia. The range of CSF opening pressure was 28 to 77 centimeters of water, so pretty significant intracranial pressure. The mean stenosis was 60%, with the range of 50 to 80%. Before stenting, the transverse sinus pressure gradient was a mean of 21 millimeters of mercury, range of 13 to 37. And post-stenting, the gradient fell to 3 millimeters of mercury, with a range of 0 to 6, which was to be expected. But did the stenting produce any clinically meaningful outcomes? Obviously it did, or I wouldn't have spent so much time talking about this small 13-patient study. While there was no control arm or placebo group, all 13 patients endorsed an improvement in their quality of life after the stenting took place. There was a significant improvement in visual fields by three months, and 20 of 24 eyes with papilledema showed improvement in the freezing grade of papilledema. There was also a mean improvement in the CSF opening pressure by 20 centimeters of water, with only one person for whom there was no change in opening pressure. The pressure for that patient actually went up one centimeter of water. And for that patient who had no change in the opening pressure, they endorsed recurrent headache at about three months, and on repeat venography, there was a new area of stenosis that was adjacent to the stent. So a second stent was deployed, and the patient reported subjective improvement in the headache symptoms, with improvement in the CSF opening pressure to 7 centimeters of water. 
At three months after the stent was placed, and this is probably the most interesting part of the study, eight of the 13 original patients were on no medications to lower their intracranial pressure, and three of the patients were on lower doses. So overall, very promising results, and very few serious complications with this treatment. According to one meta-analysis, including eight studies and 136 treated patients, again, none of these patients were randomized, the rate of major complications was only 3%, subdural hematomas, which to be honest is a comparable rate of major complications to the 8% rate that's seen in CSF diversion, although the major complications of CSF diversion also include shunt infection, tonsillar herniation, and CSF fistula formation in addition to the subdural hematomas. Minor complications were reported in 33% of patients with CSF diversion, but only 4% for transverse sinus stenting. So stenting is thought to be a safer procedure. All this data points toward the role of stenotic dural sinuses in IIH. But in addition to knowing that stenting works in IIH, let's also throw some shade on the earlier argument that impaired CSF resorption contributes to intracranial hypertension. There are lots of other considerations out there in which impaired CSF resorption exists, and it's not the same as IIH. Consider subarachnoid hemorrhage, or an infectious meningitis. Or even, let's think about children who are born with agenesis of arachnoid granulations, with dysfunction or absence of arachnoid granulations in these conditions, there's often a communicating hydrocephalus with ventriculomegaly on neuroimaging. But where is this ventriculomegaly in IAH? I don't know. So it's not a perfect fit to say that impaired CSF resorption drives this condition. Stenotic transverse sinuses may be more relevant. The bottom line is, the pathogenesis in this condition remains poorly understood. And most likely, IAH is a heterogeneous condition that's caused by variable pathogenic processes in which CSF production or resorption is dysregulated and venous drainage is impaired. There are a lot of unanswered questions about what's really happening in these patients, such as why would weight loss improve vision and clinical symptoms in patients who are obese? Weight loss and weight gain are strongly tied to IAH, and yet these factors really have nothing to do with the venous sinuses or with CSF production or resorption. Here's another question. If transverse sinus stenting can improve clinical outcomes and achieve symptomatic improvement in some patients with sinovenous stenosis, who else might benefit? And what is the threshold to consider conventional angiography for a patient who has normal appearing dural sinuses? Right now, angiography is a standard of care for evaluating intracranial venous hypertension. But a newer method has been recently described, literally hot off the press as of May 2020, in which quantitative cardiac-gated magnetic resonance venography was used to calculate a resistivity index. I have to credit Dr. Rizwan Hussein for sharing the study with me, who was one of the study's co-investigators. Basically, by measuring the venous systolic and diastolic velocities across the dural sinuses using quantitative MRV, one can calculate the relative pulse pressure of the venous system, so to speak, which can be used as a non-invasive way of measuring sinus pressure before and after stenting. Now one question I'm left with after having read this paper is, is this imaging biomarker a better predictor of IH severity or responsiveness to stenting than the degree of stenosis? The data we have that sinus stenosis correlates with disease severity and outcomes is pretty poor, as we discussed, but maybe this new measurement will replace it. A final question I'm left with pertains to CSF egress. I've mentioned arachnoid granulations a couple times already throughout the program, and historically, we used to think that CSF resorption was a process exclusively carried out by this vascular bed of arachnoid villi, which then dumped its contents into the venous sinuses. However, there is emerging evidence of a lymphatic drainage system within the central nervous system, specifically at the level of the cranial nerves and the spine. This glymphatic system may be highly relevant in IAH, and it may play a crucial role in the pathogenesis of the disease. But stenting a dural sinus should not affect the CNS glymphatics, and the aquaporin channels and other proteins that constitute the glymphatic system really aren't involved either. So ultimately, I'm stumped as to which mechanism I feel is the principal mediator of IAH pathogenesis. For now, and considering all the available evidence, I think there's no doubt that sinovenous stenosis is at least one contributor to IAH, whether it's something that's inherent to the vessel itself, or perhaps even something external to the vessel. And stenting a stenotic transverse sinus can improve outcomes in selected patients. So, in my own practice, at minimum, I'll typically refer all IIH patients for non-invasive venous imaging. And in patients for whom weight loss is difficult to achieve, or it's ineffective, 
or for whom medications result in intolerable side effects or they fail to relieve symptoms before vision loss or diplopia develop, I will consider transverse sinus stenting. Based on the limited evidence, stenting seems less invasive, it's safer, and it's at least as effective as CSF diversion. And that's it for our program on brainwaves this week. As always, this is a program intended for medical education and should not be used for routine clinical decision making. For the healthcare providers in the audience, I would strongly encourage you to appraise the available evidence on this and all other topics discussed on brainwaves, and you can find a good selection of the literature referenced in each episode's show notes. Not discussed today were other interventions like optic nerve sheath fenestration and all the complexities of medical management for IH, which includes medications as well as risk factor modification, and you should familiarize yourself with these as well. This week's episode of the Brainwaves Podcast was produced by myself, Jim Siegler. Our show is produced out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with music this week courtesy of Squire Tuck, Swelling, Three Chain Links, and Unheard Music Concepts. Our theme song was composed by Jimothy Dalton. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. For more information on what was discussed in the show, as always, take a look at the show notes for the references to the highest yield literature on the topics, and follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. I'm Jim Siegler. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.